The Things They Carried by Tim O'Brien In the Field At daybreak, the platoon of 18 soldiers formed into a loose rank and began wading side by side through the deep muck in, of that ship field. They moved slowly in the rain, leaning forward, heads down. They used the butts of the weapons as probes, wading across the field to the river and then turning and wading back again. They were tired and miserable, and all they wanted now was to get it finished. Kiowa was gone. He was under the mud and water, folded in with the war, and their only thought was to find him and dig him out and then move on to someplace dry and warm. It had been a hard night, maybe the worst ever. The rain had fallen without stop, and the song Trabang had overflown its banks, and the muck had now risen thigh deep in the field along the river. A low gray mist hovered over the land. Off to the west there was thunder, soft little moaning sounds, and the monsoon seemed to be lasting element of the war. The eighteen soldiers moved in silence. First Lieutenant Jimmy Cross went first, now and then straightening out the rank, closing up the gaps, his uniform was dark with mud. His arms and the f his face were filthy. Early in the morning, he had radioed the MIA report, giving the name and circumstances, but he was now determined to find his man, no matter what, even if it meant flying in slabs of concrete and damming up the river and draining the entire field. He would not lose a member of his command like this. It wasn't right. Kiowa had been a fine soldier and a fine human being, a devout Baptist, and there was no way Lieutenant Cross would allow such a good man to be lost under the slime of a ship field. Briefly, he stopped and watched the clouds, except for, the, for some occasional thunder. It was a deeply quiet morning, just the rain and the steady sloshing sounds of 18 men wading through the thick waters. Lieutenant Cross wished the rain would let up. Even for an hour, it would make things easier. But then he shrugged. The rain was the war, and you had to fight it. Turning, he looked out across the field and yelled at one of his ma men to close up the rank. Not a man, really, about a boy. The young soldier stood off by himself at the center of the field in knee-deep water, reaching down with both hands as if chasing some object just beneath the surface. The boy's shoulders were shaking. Jimmy Cross yelled again, but the young soldier did not turn or look up. In his hooded poncho, everything caked with mud. The boy's face was impossible to make out. The filth seemed to erase identities, transforming the men into identical copies of a single soldier, which was exactly how Jimmy Cross had been trained to treat them, an interchangeable unit of command. It was, a dif it was difficult sometimes, but he tried, he tried to avoid... That sort of thinking. He had no military ambitions. He preferred to view his men not as units, but as human beings. And Kiowa had been a splendid human being. The very best, intelligent and gentle and quiet-spoken. Very brave, too, and decent. The kid's father taught Sunday school in Oklahoma City, where Kiowa had been raised to believe in the promise of salvation under Jesus Christ, and this conviction had always been present in the boy's smile and his posture toward the world, and the way he never went anywhere without an illustrated New Testament that his father had mailed to him as a birthday present back in January. A crime, Jimmy Cost thought, looking out toward the river. He knew for a fact that he had made a mistake setting up here. The order had come from higher, true, but still he should have exercised some field discretion. He should have moved to higher ground for the night, should have radioed in false coordinates. There was nothing he could do now, but still it was a mistake and a hideous waste. He felt sick about it, standing in the deep waters of the field. First Lieutenant Jimmy Cross began composing a letter in his head to the kid's father, not mentioning the ship field, just saying what a fine soldier Kiowa had been, what a fine human being, and how he was the kind of son that any father could be proud of forever. The search went slowly. For a time, the morning seemed to brighten, the sky going to a lighter shade of silver, but the ra then the rains came back hard and steady. There was the feel of permanent twilight. At the far left of the line, Azar and Norman Bowker and Mitchell Sanders waited along the edge of the field closest to the river. They were tall men, but at times the muck came to mid-thigh, other times to the crotch. Azar kept shaking his head. He coughed and shook his head and said, Man, talk about irony. I bet if Kiowa was here, I bet he'd just laugh. Eating shit, it's your classic irony. Fine, said Norman Bowker. Now pipe down. Azar sighed, wasted in the waste, he said, a shit field, you got to admit, is a pure world-class irony. 
The three men moved with slow, heavy steps. It was hard to keep balance. Their boots sank into the ooze, which produced a powerful downward suction, and with each step they would have to pull up hard to break the hold. The rain made quick dents in the water, like tiny mouse, and the sink was everywhere. When they reached the river, they shifted a few meters to the north and began wading back up the field. Occasionally, they used their weapons to test the bottom, but mostly they just searched with their feet. Enough, Bowker said. Like those old cowboy movies, one more redskin bites the dirt. I'm serious, man. Zip it up, Azar smiled and said. Classic. The morning was cold and wet. They had not slept during the night, not even for a few moments, and all three of them were feeling the tension as they moved across the field toward the river. There was nothing they could do for Hewa. Just find him and slide him aboard a chopper. Whenever a man died, it was always the same. A desire to get it over with quickly. No fuss or ceremony. And what they wanted now was to head for a villa and get under a roof and forget what had happened during the night. Halfway across the field, Mitchell Sanders stopped. He stood for a moment with his eyes shut, feeling along the bottom with a foot. Then he passed his weapon over to Norman Bowker and reached down into the muck. After a second, he yelled up a filthy green rucksack. The three men did not speak for a time. The pack was heavy with mud and water, dead-looking. Inside were a pair of moccasins and an illustrated New Testament. Well, Mitchell Sanders finally said, the guy's around here somewhere. Better tell the L LT. Screw him. Yeah, but some lieutenant, Saunders said, Camp camps us in a toilet. Man don't know shit. Nobody knew, Bowker, Bowker said. Maybe so, maybe not. Ten billion places we could have set up last night. The man picks a latrine. Norman Bowker stared down at the rucksack. It was made of dark green nylon with an aluminum frame, but now it had the curious look of flesh. It wasn't the lieutenant's fault, Bowker said quietly. Who's then? Nobody. Nobody knew till afterward. Mitchell Sanders made a loud sound in his throat. He hoisted up... The rucksack slipped it into the harness and pulled the straps tight. All right, but this much, much for sure. This, the man knew it was raining. He knew about the river. One plus one added up. You get exactly what happened. Saunders glared at the river. Move it, he said. Q was waiting on us. Slowly then, bending against the rain, Hazar, Norma Bowker, and Mitchell Sanders began wading again through the deep waters, their eyes down, circling from where they found the rucksack. First Lieutenant Jimmy Cross stood 50 meters away. He had finished writing the letter in his head, explaining things to Kiwa's father. And now he folded his arms and watched the platoon. Crisscrossing the wide field in a funny way, it reminded him of the municipal golf course in his hometown in New Jersey. A lost ball, he thought. Tired players searching through the rough, sweeping back and and forth in long, systematic patterns. He wished he were there right now, on the sixth hole, looking out across the water, a hazard that fronted the small, flat green, a seven iron in his hand, calculating wind and the distance. A tough decision, but all you could ever lose was a ball. You did not lose a player and never had to wade out into the hazard and spend the day searching through the slime. Jimmy Cross did not want the responsibility of leaving these men. He had never wanted it. In his sophomore year at Mount Sebastian College, he had signed up for the Reserve Officer Training Corps, which, much, without much thought, an automatic thing because his friends had joined, and because it was worth a few credits, and because it seemed preferable to letting the draft take him. He was unprepared, 24 years old, and his heart wasn't in it. Military matters meant nothing to him. He did not care one way or the other about the war, and he had no desire to command, and even after all these months in the bush, all the days and nights, even then, he did not know enough to keep his men out of a shipfield.